it's not a question of my own physical perceptions or how I look at things. It's a question of how things actually are. The plain and simple fact of the matter is that we are into the third day of tabulation and I have been consistently leading in the tabulations and never in the political history of the Republic of the Philippines has a presidential candidate so consistently led in the electoral tabulations for three days and yet managed to lose at the final day. So the momentum of events has already been established. A person or any group in this country can hope or aspire to tamper with this, with this momentum only at his own risk and he will have to be prepared to face the consequences. You know, a lot of people speculate. They're saying that if that happens, if after three days of bleeding, suddenly events turn against you in the counts that are being done, that uh, you and your followers may initiate uh, uh, mass action, etc. And yet you're saying that the events have taken a momentum of their own. Hindi naman maaari na sa loob ng siguro itong ating counting ay mga pitong araw, hindi man naman maaari na tatlong araw na ang nakalipas, pare-pareho pa rin ang resulta, pagkatapos mababago pa sa ultima ora. Masyado ng dudoso iyon. Kaya hindi na sana dapat tangkain pa iyan dahil kung minsan, all the best laid plans of mice and men will go awry and will produce their natural distortions plus the consequences that they visit on the head of the person who has artificially engineered the process. Kaya sana, tanggapin na lang natin ang ating kapalaran at ang binibigay sa atin ng Panginoon. Huwag na sana tayo maghanap pa ng gulo. We should not go out of our way to exacerbate what is already a volatile situation because the Comelec is on top of the situation, the Catholic Church through its parish pastoral councils for responsible voting, and the entire citizenry. It would in fact be an insult to the Filipino nation when its will has been so clearly manifested and articulated in the polls if someone should dare, like King Canute, to sit on the shore and order the waves to stop. The tidal wave of reform has already set in. It can no longer be stopped. Okay, we'll play the same game that uh, some of the other interviewers were playing with Secretary Ramos. Uh, I think uh, they asked him about his cabinet. What sort of a cabinet would a Miriam Santiago cabinet be? I've already said in the campaign period that at least half of my cabinet will be 40 years old and below. It is essential that we must have youth in the incoming cabinet because the sheer physical rigors of work in the executive department demand it. The person must possess not only the necessary physical and mental, possibly emotional fortitude, but he must be willing to be a hands-on administrator. He cannot afford to have a desk job for six years. And so at least half of them must be young men and women. The other half, in order to produce the requisite mix of experience and um, sense of adventure, should be highly successful professionals who have already earned their laurels in their respective fields of endeavor. But in any event, the cabinet must be a balanced mix. The way I, I don't know, maybe I'm, uh, I might be misreading you, but the, the way I read it is a lot of, most of your cabinet members are going to be from the private sector. Uh, yes, that below is 40 and then the ones who are professionals, etc. So most of them would come from the private sector. And I would not entirely discount the possibility that some of them might even come, come from the rival political camps who were engaged uh, against me in the last campaign. In other words, I wouldn't be beyond requesting my own political opponents to join me in my administration, possibly through the cabinet or in some other governmental position. Secretary Ramos said exactly the same thing. He said that uh, he would offer jobs to those uh, who opposed him. So it sounds like a nice uh, a balance no? if, you, uh, uh, if you're going to do the same thing. The, the only problem seems to be that the Constitution, for example, prohibits any uh, one who runs for an elective office to accept a job within one year uh, to an appointed capacity. So that would rule out most of the uh, politicians. And are you now looking at a cabinet uh, in which there are going to be very few politicians? No, I will need at least a few politicians in the cabinet because my expertise in that direction is deficient and they will have to supply it. Okay, today Sec uh, Senator uh, uh, Neptali Gonzalez was saying, whoever becomes president 
will have to contend with an LDP-dominated Congress, or at least almost certainly an LDP-dominated Senate. One of the things that, uh, in case you become president, uh, you will have to contend with is probably an opposition Congress or a Congress not uh, of the same kind of uh, political uh, uh, perception that you have. How are you going to be able to deal with them? Are you going to appoint uh, a liaison, liaison for the Senate and a liaison for the House and just treat them uh, at a distance? Or, as you said, a hands-on presidency, are you going to you know, bring them into the government to make uh, decisions? Because Congress is supposed to set policy and you're supposed to execute it. I am certainly not going to be a Brunhilda in hobnail boots trampling over the corpses of my political adversaries, no. When I took my Bachelor of Arts degree in the University of the Philippines, I specialized in political science and in fact for a considerable period of time I was a professor of political science and then as we all know I proceeded to law school and finished my law degrees and thus for all of my entire professional life, I have always been taught to pay allegiance to the principle that in our tripartite system of government, there are three co-equal branches. Two are political in nature, one is judicial. The two political co-equal branches are the executive and the legislative. Thus, as president, I shall be entirely prepared to treat Congress as a co-equal branch of government to exhibit a sense of healthy respect for what is after, for people whom, after all, will be my equals in that government. And I promise that they shall always be fully informed of develop, developments in the executive branch and always fully consulted. I think, yeah, that, that matters. Because uh, one of the things that, uh, for example, I remember I wrote about considerably during the past uh, several years is a constant complaint on the part of the House and the Senate leadership that they're never presented with the legislative agenda. In fact, uh, they read in the newspapers that the palace would like this kind of a bill. They don't even send a draft uh, a bill to the house for its consideration. Uh, since you are, you know, a professor of constitutional law and are, uh, was a judge and is a legal luminary in your own light, uh, are you going to create a process whereby uh, legislation can be discussed with Congress first? and uh, probably some kind of a consensus arrived at, rather than uh, just announcing the newspapers and then have a confrontational situation. Oh yes, definitely. That would be the optimum procedure. And I intend that in this age of information technology, Congress should always be fully informed of the legislative initiatives of the executive branch of government, even only out of what is called in political science, interdepartmental committee, committee meaning courtesy. Okay, uh, I noticed that, let's go back to the elections for a while. I noticed that a lot of uh, the votes that you've been getting, I understand you won in Sambuanga City, uh, in some areas of Mindanao. The Muslims uh, had a, uh, well, were supposed to have, well, anyway, the MNLF was supposed to have signed an agreement with one of the presidential candidates, the details of which nobody really knows about. But, Traditionally, the Muslims have pushed for the Tripoli Agreement uh, and, uh, of course, the ones who, like the presidential candidate who uh, apparently talked with them has been accused of treason, etc. What sort of an attitude would you take towards this aspiration to have the Tripoli Agreement enforced in the face of an autonomous Muslim Mindanao region? What would be your policy in that particular area? When I was very young, straight out of law school, when in my first year, I believe, as a lawyer, I had some participation in the drafting, or at least in the eval legal evaluation of the Tripoli Agreement. And I believe that it is already out of sync in 1992. Thus, the very least that we should do with respect to this document is to re-examine it, particularly its basis. It is a legitimate aspiration of our Muslim countrymen in Mindanao to desire its implementation at this late date but it should certainly bear careful scrutiny we should proceed with all deliberate speed in its implementation and my own position at this point is that it is in dire need of certain drastic changes you're a constitutional law professor uh, I understand that when the Tripoli agreement was signed by Marcos or was approved he put in a provision